Hey guys, it's Matt. I watched, probably have seen it about five times over the years. It came out in 2001. I watched the movie A Beautiful Mind last night starring Russell Crowe. And two things. Number one, if you're driving, um, you won't need to see any of this. Just thumbnails. We'll go over to the Wikipedia page for both the movie and the life of this John Nash. And two, the purpose of this video is no movie has ever just blatantly told us how fake how fa how fake the world economy is just came out and just told us <laughs> then this movie um it just tells you this is how it's done um it's just collusion it's we use we base everything off the nash equilibrium we'll all work together we'll make it seem like capitalism and it will be actually capitalism on the lower levels you poor devils can battle it out in your town and in your cities, amongst your taco shops and your hoagie huts and your sunglass huts. And that, that will all be real competition. So on the ground, it will certainly look like capitalism. It's never, it's never true capitalism. It's crony capitalism is the best way to put it, but it's just a fake capitalism is what it is. But at the highest levels, oh, it's just George Carlin. It's, it's a big club. And you ain't in it. That's what it is at the high. And they all work together using the Nash game theory and equilibrium to all get ahead together. I just told you in the movie. Well, let's just jump to the main scene in the movie. Russell Crowe is John Nash at Princeton getting his PhD. I guess he would be roughly 21 or 22 or 23 years old. All these guys, these super geniuses, they just rush through their school like i guess they're little do doogie housers they get it done and get high school done by eighth grade etc so he's probably pretty young but it's played by russell crowe it looks a little ridiculous <laughs> i guess at this point he's probably about 38 or 39 <laughs> playing a 22 year old kid but there's four other guys or three other f phds four others that are also trying to, to get their phd at princeton in mathematics and john nash is very awkward and nerdy around girls he doesn't socialize well there's a scene in a bar where i guess i guess four girls come in one girl is significantly prettier as a blonde haired girl or woman than the others and they all start into the regular guy thing who's gonna get the blonde you know i'm gonna go for her i'm gonna go for her and john get nash gets his idea um for his equilibrium theory that well we're all going to screw each other over by going for the blonde. We're all going to get in each other's way. Nobody's going to get her. It's going to be a problem. How we all win is if we all work together and nobody goes for the blonde-haired girl. We just go for her three friends. It doesn't matter. You know, He's explaining this game theory regarding picking up girls in the Princeton bar uh, that later corporations would use to, to ultimately collude... <laughs> To, with each other to make Mark Zuckerberg billions and billions of more dollars and to screw the little guy. But that's, that's we'll talk about that later. It doesn't really matter, I guess, what the other girls look like or what they have to say. They're going to, he says, no, you, what you, we want to do is we work together to go for the other girls. We'll all, we'll all help each other and we will avoid going for the ultimate prize. In this case, the ultimate prize of like winning world domination in business represents the the blonde. If we all go for the blonde and translate into a corporate type scenario, then one might win and put everybody else out of business, or we might kill each other trying to get the blonde, which represents like cor corporate domination of the world. But if we all work together and just go for her friends, <laughs> then we all can get a girl, we all can win. So this bar scene is both an analogy and an allegory for what exists today with corporations um, under the guise of just competition. It's all collusion. They all work together. There's a reason nobody fails. No of these large companies are ever displaced. Nobody small ever comes up to take their place. I mean, we know this is how it's working. The only question would be how long this system's been in place. Well, we'll talk about, I want to keep, in case I, I, anybody got, you know, came upon this by mistake, I want to keep the conspiracy uh, out of it for now. We'll talk about uh, the crazy stuff at the end, of which the person that stumbled upon this won't understand or can't believe they wasted their time 
with such a video. We'll keep it to a minimum for now. Some guy walking his dog's like, keep the conspiracy to a minimum? This crazy man just suggested that these companies and corporations are all working together and what's presented in every university that capitalism survival of the fittest adam smith one company's out to get the other company and put the other company out of business and wall street and greed is good and all that doesn't exist it's a facade he said keep the conspiracy to a minimum in talking about how the world really works, it is hard from your perspective, sir, walking your dog to keep the conspiracy to a minimum because the entire world is a collusive conspiracy. Now, go walk your dog and shut up. So this bar scene, the Princeton bar with the doctoral students, of which John Nash is one, it's both an allegory and an analogy. When the pretty girl comes in, one of them starts talking about Adam Smith. Adam Smith's philosophy is, you know, self-interest. You actually help everything in the economy. Greed is good. Self-interest. Do what's best for you actually benefits everyone else through uh, superior ideas, new innovative processes. You know, it's we're, we're in it to help ourselves first. Adam Smith says, let's, you know, we have to compete for the blonde. And then John Nash or whatever says, no, Adam Smith is wrong completely wrong from the perspective of how this corporate footsie uh, 1000 global does business together. It, he is, he was wrong. They don't use Adam Smith. They use this equilibrium game theory to collude and all work together to, to, so they keep their positions. And none of them go for the blonde, which is risky because it puts other people out of business. He says, Adam Smith was, was wrong. Well, as a those that think um, around two corners at the same time as conspiracy assholes like we are, then we we never go far enough. I would propose is the whole Adam Smith notion a ruse? What? You know, I'm not. Hey, I'm not. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying this has to be on the table. Was the Adam Smith notion of um, helping yourself before others? self-servancy, I don't know if that's a word, I just made it up, I like that, self-servancy, was that ever on the table? It was presented for hundreds of years in uh, economics classes in the London School of Economics, and there's uh, statues all over the UK and Scotland to Adam Smith, but one has to wonder, was that a ruse? It's, maybe it's always been a collective collusion. And before I started this, I did look up Adam Smith to see if he's from London or from Scotland or from Ireland or Northern Ireland or Welsh and oh gosh forbid you know an American gets that wrong they're very that's blasphemy if I were to say he was from Sandwich or from Lower England but he's Scottish oh my goodness that would be the biggest blasphemy of, of all time um, once when I was I'll get to back to the point in a minute guys but it just reminded me of something once when I was working at the library at Penn State I worked in that damn library a thousand hours. A thousand, they gave me a thousand hours award, four dollars an hour. But there were no taxes <laughs> just because it was work study through student program. You got the, you got to keep the four dollars. I mean, I didn't know what to because I'd have to pay taxes on it. I was just rolling in dough. I was driving Corvettes around campus. Anyway, this woman came up, and um, I don't know. I always liked accents and even I didn't know anything about anything back in the day I'd never traveled anywhere and I said oh you're from London <laughs> she she looked at me like she was going to kill me no I'm not going to try to do the accent she might even be listening to she come get me no I'm Welsh and I was like you know from a, let's say I was 18 at the time I was like so what? That's the same thing. Who cares? I don't know. You know, we didn't, obviously, they have a whole heritage. So I'm not, okay, Adam Smith, Scottish. But they've got statues of him all over the UK, Scottish. And, and you know, during the research, it said that he came out of the Scottish Enlightenment. We Americans, we didn't even know such a thing existed. The only thing we know about Scotland is Braveheart, the movie. That's it. There's a bunch of people. Longshanks gets pissed and they run, hide, the Highland way. That's all we know. What's Scottish enlightenment? It almost seems like an oxymoron, but sorry. Um, take take it easy, guys. I know uh, I just saw Peaky Blinders. I don't need to be visited by, by um, what were they calling Peaky Blinders? <laughs> the Bully Boys. I don't need no visit from the Bully Boys. Relax. We shouldn't align ourselves too closely to any national heritage 
as we understand what has been going on for a long time uh, anyway, right guys? So so j just just kidding. They take things over there a little bit more seriously than we do here in the U.S. You want to cut up Ben Franklin? I don't give a shit. I don't associate with that crap anymore. So an interesting thing to ponder, and we'll never quite figure it out. We know the collusion exists today. Okay? I, I'm not sure if I have to spend a few minutes proving that. I probably should talk about that for a few minutes for anybody that even there's part of the truth community that still believes they believe too much in corporate competition they believe too much that countries are making their own decisions no now all all we need to really determine if we if we even care about determining it is when it when it changed how long this beast system has been in place was adam smith and the notion of adam smith a, a ruse to begin with you know, if you're driving, you're really missing out on these exciting G7 and G and G8 meeting pictures. <laughs> G, we're, oh, there's one with Boris uh, Johnson smiling with Biden. And there's one where Angela Merkel's leaning across a table. It looks like they're having a very serious competition with Trump. Who has more power? None of them. None of them. With us? None of them. It's a ruse. It's a gigantic ruse the whole thing they probably go and just play with chicken mcnuggets they don't decide anything in these conferences no way no way the only thing to, to even argue about is did they ever like when they got to get when fdr you know they they um they carted him overseas to to meet with other leaders was that real i mean the only question is we know it's not now the only question is as usual was it ever real it's just like that when they were flying on TWAs in Jarhead to Gulf War One, that, that my favorite scene of all time. You know what happens when you get to that tenth level of Metroid, and they all lean in. You no, know what you've gotten there? What? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know what happens when world leaders get together at G7 or G8 conferences, and they go behind closed doors, and all their um, um, their entourages are there, and their security detail, and the Secret Service, and they're discussing what the next 10 or 15 years will look at. You know what, you know what happens? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because it's all, it's already running. The world economy is running on the damn Whopper supercomputer. There's no, it's all, maybe it started with John Nash's equilibrium which i think they call it non-collaborative game theory something like not yeah it's it's they call it as a ruse a non-collaborative when the whole thing is, is about collaboration and collusion and see there the, the look at the ag companies the top ag companies agriculture like archer daniels midlam adm and cargill and nutrien and there's actually companies on the list that are pharma companies that makes you feel all good inside. You go look up the top ag companies, which I did agriculture before this segment, and DuPont is there, as is Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, from Germany. I mean, there might not be a company anywhere in the world more evil if you look into the nitty-gritty of what this company's been involved in, in, in than Bayer. And that's saying something. Matt, have you ever heard of Monsanto? Yeah, that's saying something, I know, and that is a little reckless. I'm sure there's a lot of companies that have done just as much evil shit as Bear, but Bear, Bear might take the cake. Anyway, so there's pharma companies listed in the top 10 for agriculture. That makes you feel good. But the point is, guys, uh, look at, okay, Cargill and ADM. They're, it's competition. They still tell us it's just capitalism. Those people at ADM want to put those sons of bitches at Cargill out of business, right? Yeah, sure. You'll never so let's so so ADM in their backroom conversations be like, oh, there are car gills. I'm just making all this up. I don't know. I mean, I'm not making up what I believe about the way the world economy works in terms of what crops they're selling, and I don't know. So Cargill maybe is big on soybeans. I don't know. And AB, ADM's like, if we corner the soybean market, we can put those sons of bitches out of business. They'll one knows exactly what the other one's going to produce. You know, and, and if somebody's screaming at me, well, Matt, this is a bad example. Per national security, the government stepped in and make sure they don't, um, you know, make soybean, drive soybean prices down to a penny each and then put all the other crops out. Okay, that's a, if anything worked the way it should, then that is a good point. So maybe this isn't the greatest example. But they know what each other's going to produce. They know exactly what each other's going to do. And agriculture is a bad example. 
because if anything were real and governments really cared about people, then then food would be a national security issue. It's a bad example, but you know, but look at any industry. The top players remain. Look at the top electronics companies or the top automakers or the top company here. The the top players all stay put. Their relative positions might shift a little bit because they have to make the John Nash equilibrium game theory and look real that they're really competing against each other. But none of these companies are ever displaced. Name 10 big companies that have gone out of business in the last 10 years. And I'm not talking the bull crap that the sacrificial lambs that they offer up to make it look good. Like people would be screaming at me, leaping out of their bathtub saying, Kmart went out of business. Sacrificial lambs, bull crap. Just bull crap. Polaroid, gee, Polaroid went out of business about 15 years ago. Um, Pam actually had a Polaroid DVD because after the, the cameras, they started dabbling in electronics and they couldn't do that right. That Matt, Matt, that proves it's all real. Great, Polaroid, Sacrificial Lamb, Kmart, Sears, um, pe- a thousand Payless shoe source, uh, stores went out of business. A thousand or more Radio Shack stores went under. But so what? They, whether that's real or not, they're going to let some companies go down, whether they got a giant payout or not, a thanks for coming, whether that was completely real. But in terms of those in the George Carlin Club, right, just you know the companies we're talking about, they'll never go under. Okay, they're just, they're in, they're on that side of the fence. They're, the, the, the big companies that nobody can ever put anybody out of business for 20 years. And I'm not talking about a, a tech company where the stock might drop 90 some. Tech is different, okay? I'm talking about the big staples of the FTSE 1000 or the Fortune 500. Guys, it's not natural how these same companies exist. The John Nash and the equilibrium theory, they told you right out there in a beautiful mind that what's best, Adam Smith was wrong. What's best for business is if they just all help each other and... You know, why not just tell us, guys? You know, they, but they'll still tell you in your economics classes. Just the economics class is pure bullcrap, and the professor doesn't know. The professor doesn't know anything. He's just quoting his same dumb economic theory. The professor, he or she, has no clue as to how this works, and it's not even done, in my opinion, anymore by men and women. It's all done. The whole economy is managed on the the Whopper computer simulation, as is the stock market. It's the only possible way to keep this ruse going, as if it would be completely managed on a supercomputer. So does, like, ADM even decide what crops, do people even decide what crops or where resources should be allocated? Or even something like Tyson Foods with poultry? Probably not. Honestly, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they get a... um, they get a they get an owl. They get a Harry Potter owl with a little parchment tied to its leg, and it says, "We're going to produce soybeans." Why? Because Whopper and Joshua said so. Joshua, yeah, that sentience inside the Whopper computer. Here's what we need to do. It's telling them the world economy is one gigantic John Nash game theory. Why do you think they gave him the Nobel? Pro- he went crazy. It's in real life. He went crazy. But but his little paper. Um, his little paper took their collusion to a higher level, maybe to a level that they didn't think was possible, and he was rewarded for it with the Nobel Prize. This is the Wikipedia page on the movie. I know you can't see it. Don't worry about it. Move away from this page in just a second. There's a little gematria here. You know, I'm not a gematria person. Some of the numbers are a little suspect. Again, I'm no expert at it. I can just kind of point it or sniff it out and say, this is the matrix code here. But the reason I'm showing it, just a few things, guys. Remember remember um, what's going on here. You have, before the movie, a guy nobody's ever heard of. Of course, he's if he took their level or their ability to clue to a whole new level, he's a hero in, quote, their circles. But from the regular guy or gal, who are movies made for? Nobody's ever heard of this person. So this is a... And it's not that exciting. It really isn't. The way it's done is brilliant. And it's great, great Ron Howard movie making. I mean, it's it's wonderful movie making. But if you take a step back, I was like, well, wait a second. This isn't a great story. 
It's about a guy. I mean, if I just told you what it's about, you'd never go see the movie. But it's an it's an ode to themselves. It's it's a pat on the back to themselves. It's a pat on the back. See, those at the top of the pharmaceutical companies who know exactly how the, the this this paper that John Nash wrote is probably dictating how the world economy runs, they see this in a different way, of course. They see it in a way that is never revealed to the man or woman on the street. We can only se- we sniff it out and sense it from here because we observe how the world works and it, there's no other other way it can be working than this. The whole thing would have fallen apart 20 years ago if there wasn't this level of collusion and everything wasn't completely run on a supercomputer in terms of the the, the world central banks and the major stock markets and indices and things like that. So, but if you just think about it, and I were to just tell you, I'm going to make a movie. My, and my neighbor says, oh, you're going to make a movie? I'm going to make a movie. Well, what's it about? It's about a guy in the 40s who uh, writes a 28-page paper, and then businesses start using his theory in the paper to do better business. Oh, Matt, that ain't going to sell, my man. That ain't going to ever become a movie if it was about... Um, you know, you, you laid out the plot for um, the score, stealing the scepter with Robert De Niro in the bottom of the Montreal um, Customs House. And that's, you know, but Matt, if you do a plot for a movie, see, there's no plot here. It's really well done from a movie perspective because they, they put every resource into it. And this was made in 2001, I guess, before they lost their power of creativity in terms of making a good movie. I mean, this is this is taking a very average plot scheme. Literally, a guy writes a 28-page paper and businesses use it. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, he goes crazy in the middle. The middle 45 minutes of A Beautiful Mind is absolutely the worst part. The beginning and the end is the best. There's nothing here. But it's an ode to themselves. It's a pat on the back to themselves. It's also truth hidden in plain sight. Where when the when the pretty girl comes in, he just tells you Adam Smith is wrong, and the only way um, to really go about things, guys, is if we all collude and help each other. It tells you, uh, hidden in plain sight, what is really going on, and then they put the ultimate creative talent and resources to make a movie out of it, so they could applaud it. Now, one thing, if if that, I think that would ring true to anybody listening. You're saying, yeah, this isn't just an, it's a pat on the back to themselves. And they made it so good that the regular popcorn cruncher goes and sees the movie and they're like, that was really good. Well, what, you know, and then you describe what it was about. It's like, it was about a guy that wrote a 28 page paper. How could it be good? I don't know. It was just good. They put all the resources into it. And I guess they still had the creative uh, power. What was it before? I keep thinking that, that it's, I think it's Braveheart. Be- before my father lost his power of speech, his last will, his last wish was to see William Wallace hung. Before this system lost its creative power to make good movies, somehow in 2001, this squeaked out. They probably wrote it and filmed it and everything before the big event to make sure it was good. And then they started losing their creative powers, it seemed like, after the big event in 2001. The official release date on this is 2001. So... Again, if you just look at who's involved, Universal Pictures with DreamWorks. I mean, but again, guys, I'm, I'm hoping this is coming out right. The story, if you're just making a movie, there is no movie. There's no story. It's about a guy that wrote a paper. Like, it, it's so well done. It, you know, there's, in other words, it, it would never, ever be made if it wasn't of the utmost importance to this system itself. If you see, I think you understand what I'm saying. Um... Release date, December, is it, let me see, December 13th, 2001. Yeah, the 13th worldwide, but then the U.S., they held it back. Why? The U.S., December 12th. No, 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 sorry. It says the U.S. release date. It's so it's small even for me, guys. December 21st, 2001. 12 2001 You don't, oh, I'm no expert at it, but oh, there's some gematria there, guys. One, two, three. Two one two one. Oh yeah. Well, what exactly? What power do they gain from that, Matt? I don't know, but we can sniff it out. Oh, the gematria is there, no doubt about it. And it was released, uh, premiered in Beverly Hills. Think about that. 
Think about that. What was the last movie you've ever heard of? Not that you don't have to be no Siskel and Ebert expert at this. When was the last movie was premiered in Beverly Hills? I heard, we all heard of the man. That the man Chinese theater. The man Chinese theater ain't in Beverly Hills. It's in the seediest, crappiest part of Hollywood. Go watch the Sade No Ordinary Love video with all the homeless and people running around after her and all the trash blowing around the street. That's basically what the neighborhood where the man's Chinese theater uh, is. The the um, Cranberry song, This Is Not Hollywood Like I Understood. Yeah, Hollywood itself sucks. I mean, I don't know what it looks like now. In 96, when I was there, 96 to 99... Um, it was, it was almost like dangerous. Like, you know, you wouldn't even be out on the streets or something at night. So, um, but premiered, that's where man, man's Chinese theater is where, where they premiere a lot of big movies and they premiere other places in Los Angeles, but Beverly Hills, I'm no expert, but that's again, a movie like this, that's an ode to themselves saying, look what we've done for ourselves. And look how John, I don't think John Nash, he probably was a real guy that really wrote this communist type 28 page thing that we all help each other. And I bet he's not even, I mean, he went, he probably, it's probably a real story, probably did go crazy. They used it. That, that doesn't mean he was in on anything. They probably, they, they gave him the Nobel Prize like, what, 40 years later or something? They, he doesn't probably understand how the world colludes. He, they used his theory. He probably had no idea ultimately how it was used. You know, he probably thinks it's being used for the little benign ways they say it's being used. Like, F so, it's a, John, you're, in terms of FCC bandwidth auctions, your theories, I mean, bullcrap. They probably use it for everything in terms of ultimate collusion. And um, it's not, a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a conjoined twins monopoly. They, I mean, there are no, oh, we busted up those trust busters, those, those good trust busters working for you. They busted up all the monopolies. Once the monopolies were gone, what were we left with? Basically the same thing. It's like that, that line or scene from The Patriot where Mel Gibson says, you know, why should I trade one tyrant 3,000 miles away? This, he's dropping the 33. Of course he is in The Patriot. Also drops... The, the nine number with the with the subsequent two digits above number early when he's making the damn rocking chair. Why should I trade one uh, tyrant 3,000 miles away for 3,000 tyrants one mile away? It's, why should I trade the Standard Oil Rockefeller monopoly for 10 companies that are going to collude together to do the exact same thing? And then they'll tell you what a wonderful job they did busting up the monopolies. It's no different. It just puts, it just spreads the money around a little bit better, better, you know, I don't have a good word there, a little bit more efficiently, the money's spread around on their side of the fence. So instead of all being standard oil, then you can spread the money around more efficiently on their side of the fence, the side of the river that you regular little Cretan, you, you part of the, you and me part of the great unwashed will never participate in. Not that we ever, uh, we would want to now, but then standard oil. And then that brought in ConocoPhillips and uh, Mobile and Exxon and Chevron and all in Marathon um, and Valero um refining and all these companies all these mega oil companies all came from standard oil and so it doesn't you're whole, you're still left with the same situation where still the little guy has no chance to compete and it's all to me it's just the guise of capitalism the guise of good people working for you to bust up monopolies so the you get one job of the hut um and he's 80,000 pounds and then you just split him up into 80 job of the huts, 1,000 pounds. Whereas the little guy still, each of those job of huts is still big enough to just squash us. So what's the difference? There is no difference. Okay, for this particular presentation about a beautiful mind, if there's anybody out there that doesn't really see what I'm saying, the guy that was walking his dog, and let me close with this example. There's nothing that proves the one world system and the one world economic system more than China. There's nothing that proves that country borders and flags and the notion of national sovereignty is basically a, a ruse. Nothing proves it more than China. 
in the 60s, you basically, this is what China was in the 60s. I wasn't there in the 60s, but I think that history as it's presented to us is pretty accurate. It was uh, 500 million people in gray suits and 500 million people in blue suits. The same suit, just slightly different. There wasn't nothing there for the most part. I don't, I'm not going out on a limb. You know, I don't, don't get all upset at me. Those with a Chinese heritage, there wasn't nothing there. There wasn't nothing there. Okay, then, then we hear, what do we hear? Yeah, okay, they had electricity. They didn't have nothing. Okay, it wasn't, it didn't look like London. Okay, it didn't look like Paris. It didn't look like New York City. It was uh, 400 million people on bicycles in the same gray suit. I don't, I'm sorry. So then we hear, what do we hear? Oh, Nixon's a historical visit, one of the biggest news events of all time, the 1972 Nixon trip to China. That's probably when the masters of the one world system on behalf of the screen called Nixon and said, okay, let's put this news story forth. You go to China. And then this is kind of, we're announcing to everybody down the line that we're going to then use China over the next 50 years to manufacture absolutely everything. The fact that China manufactures, I want to say nine out of 10 things. It's more some, in some areas, it's 99 out of a hundred things. Go, how many things could you flip over in your house right now that doesn't say made in China? Even I've got plates, plates that say microwave safe on them that I remember I had back in Penn State in the 90s. They, I just flipped them over the other day. I'm always looking for some other country. It says manufactured in China. Everything is. Now, this is unnatural. It's obviously China was selected by a one world system for, to fulfill this role. Of course they were. I've been over this recently. There's So there's no other country that wanted to compete for manufacturing? There's no, just nobody can do it as well as the Chinese. Well, there are, look, I, I, if I was going up against somebody and they're on the other side of the podium, they could make very strong presentation that because of the communist system and the way their manufacturing is and no rights, that they can make the widget cheaper and more efficiently maybe via the, the, not the carrot approach, just the stick approach, the quack, qu crack of the whip stick approach. Okay, fine. The person at the other side of the podium could make that presentation and I would make the presentation back. Well, that might have worked in the 70s and 80s and early part of the 90s. Go look at a picture of what downtown Beijing and downtown Shanghai looks like today. 85, 95 story skyscrapers, the whole lit up trains that, you know, hover via electromagnetism, hundred million dollar train systems, infrastructure systems, half the Chinese are billionaires. So, okay, if they had the manufacturing advantages when they were happy to work for three cents a day, they don't work for three cents a day today, but the manufacturing's still there. So person that would take me on on the other side of the podium, what do you say about that? This, what, the picture that you see now of China, say this is 65 or 72 or whatever, is that what China looks like today? No, but yet they still have a stranglehold on the manufacturing. It's unnatural, and it's all by design. This final image, exciting image of a Google Images screenshot, which is all um, I could be comfortable showing you, is of Bangladesh. And the point to close here is... If the world were real, I'm not even sure this is in my list. I need to go back and add to the 50 pages of just endless things. Like if the world were real, this wouldn't exist or this would have changed a long time ago. We'll add this one to the list. If the world were real, probably about the year 2000 or 2005, the lower end products would have left China and they would have shifted away to, take your pick, 50 other, quote, poor countries that would like to be involved in manufacturing products for U.S. and Japanese and European multinationals. Now, okay, if somebody's screaming at me, well, Matt, it, you think it's easy to make an iPhone and, and chip equipment? Fine, if China has the clean rooms and they have all the technology that's developed over 30 or 40 years, then fine, they will always control that. But what about, what about the bottom of your sneakers? What about plates and dishes? What about ceramic cats? What about balls of yarn? What about textiles? What about rubber dog shit? What about all the crap, well, no pun intended, that literally still seems to come out of China? Wouldn't all that lower end stuff have gone away from China? And I know every once in a while you can find something in your house that says made in Taiwan, made in Malaysia. I, but how rare is that, guys? It's almost, it's still 
China dominating everything. The, the other countries like Bangladesh here or whatever, somebody, I'm not talking, I don't know anything about Bangladesh specifically. If you say, if you come to me and tell me why manufacturing of, of even the lowest products wouldn't be really advisable for a multinational to get involved with Bangladesh, well then fine, substitute 50 other countries. In Nairobi, Kenya, anywhere, the low-end products would have left China 20 years ago because they would have become too expensive. Just take one look at Shanghai. It's nothing but skyscrapers. There's every every 5G networks, every there's more technology there than in New York City. That comes with a price. So, you know, well, how are they keeping the prices down on the low end stuff? I I don't know. But look, it's just this could go on and on. It's so obvious China was chosen as the world manufacturer. And the other thing regarding China that gives the one world system away is they always um try to keep up this, this um, I don't know what to call it, like a, a two-headed ruse, a two-headed monster ruse regarding China. On one side, we've known since the early 80s that all the manufacturers going there and all the U.S. and, and uh, Japanese and um, Italian and Swiss and French and British companies, they trust China to manufacture absolutely everything. So that's going on. But on the other side, and they've been presenting this, guys, for 30 years. All this political turmoil. And there's going to be, oh, oh, there's going to be, people talk about a physical war, but then there's trade wars and sanctions and, and Chinese pilots and their MiGs buzzing American F 18s under the Clinton administration. You have to be as old as me to remember this. And always this tension and China's, um, filling in the South China Sea and increasing their territory and ch tension over Taiwan and the old Formosa. And it's just all this political tension that could potentially lead to conflict and war. But then at the same time, all the manufacturing and all the trust of the big multinationals keeps going into China. Well, just from a, if anything were real from a, from a common sense perspective, when, wouldn't the, 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 possibility of a political turmoil that could lead to war, wouldn't that kind of, uh, wouldn't you be a little reserved before giving uh, China a $150 million investment to say build a factory? And that's, I mean, that's just one little drop in the bucket. There's been trillions of dollars of investment in China. So how do you, it's the same exact ruse, two-headed ruse situation basically going on with Russia that proves the one world system. You have the same tensions. Oh, the Ru Russian MiGs buzzed, um, they'll have some bullcrap story, buzzed a U.S. carrier group, and Putin's going to do this, and he's going to invade Georgia, and it's gonna, there could be a war. But at the same time, the U.S., if you want to look at the space program, I'm not, guys, you know my... You know my opinions on this. I want the video to load. Um, I'm not going to get in, 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 you know, obviously. You know my tuna fish can uh, ideas on this. So we the, the U.S. just drops the, the shuttle program. Guys, last thing. You, you, know, you know where I'm coming from here. They, but, and then they trust the Russians <laughs> for the U.S. space interests. They trust the Russians, but then the news will tell you how there was this conflict and the Russian MiGs buzzed the U.S. carrier group and there could be a war because if Putin shows any more signs of aggression, well then, their, their trust in Russia, it's a two heads. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and same with China. Political turmoil, give them all the investment. Russia, political turmoil, potential war, trust them with your space program. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. How do the, the idiots that live down your cul-de-sac not see through this shit? Anyway, guys, thanks for listening.